teams, three men in a team, sent them out to look for footprints. And then we spent uh, quite a bit of time interviewing villagers who said they'd seen one and talking to them and getting descriptions of what they'd seen. The Yeti was uh, believed to be um, a primate and uh, there was some suspicion that it might be an ape of some kind. But the great interest on the part of scientists was the fact that it walked upright and all of the sighting reports described something walking on two legs, something bipedal. Local villagers supported that theory when they were shown images of known primates. We took along pictures, photographs, eight by ten black and whites, uh, one of a gorilla, chimpanzee and orangutan, and they had never seen anything like that. But they looked at them, and when they looked at the gorilla, they, they thought it was a yeti. They said, this is what the yeti looks like. Uh, we also had pictures of bears, lots of bears up there. They recognized those, of course. But the nearest thing in their comparison of what they were seeing with our pictures was of a gorilla although in the, in the case of the Yeti, much smaller. Byrne's search for the abominable snowman spanned a period of more than three years and led to a mysterious monster, said to harbor the ultimate evidence. And he said, oh, he said, we have a Yeti hand up in the temple. Would you like to see it? Um, in north, north central Nepal, there is um, one large monastery. It's called Tiangbuchi Monastery, and then a number of temples and we based there for a while. The monks were extremely protective of the hand and hid it deep within the monastery at Pangboshe. We went up to the temple um, in the dark and um, went into a locked room and he brought out a box and in this box there was a mummified hand about the same size as my hand, average size male human hand. And I was very excited about this and I said, can I have it? And he said, no, you can't have it. So I photographed it, and I sent the photographs back to London, to Dr. Osmond Hill. Eventually the answer came back, you've got to get the hand, or at least part of it. Byrne pleaded with the monks, who eventually partially relented. And the old lama let me take one finger of the hand and leave the rest there. So we cabled Tom in code, and I said, we've got the finger. What do you want us to do with it? The relic would have to be smuggled out of the country. Word came from London that Byrne was to meet an American in India. He cabled back and he said, go to Calcutta and meet with the Mr. and Mrs. Stewart. So I trekked down across Nepal, got a train, went to Calcutta, got a taxi, went to the Grand Hotel, went upstairs, and, this, and the, the Mr. and Mrs. Stewart was Jimmy Stewart, there, the great actor, and his wife. So I gave them the finger. And they were worried about customs going out of India, they were worried about customs getting into London. So Gloria, Jimmy's wife, put the finger in her lingerie case. And when they got to London airport, the lingerie case had disappeared. A few days later at Claridge's hotel, a young man came up from reception and said, there's a customs man here who wants to see you. So Jimmy said, send him up. The young customs man came up with Gloria's lingerie case and gave it to her, and she said, well, thank you very much, but you haven't opened it. And he said, a British customs official would never open a lady's lingerie case. And that's how the finger got out of the pole and got to Dr. Osmond Hill. Osmond Hill eventually examined it, and others examined it, and all they could say about it, it was the thumb of, of the hand, all they could say about it is it's not a human thumb. The doctor died and no one knows what happened to the finger. But the finger was not the only piece of the monster that was hidden in the monastery. In, uh, in one of the um, monasteries um, in north central Nepal, they had what they said was a yeti scalp, um, the skin taken off the top of the head um, from the temple upwards, and it was dried, and we saw it there and they regarded it as a relic, so there was a certain reverence around it because um, they didn't have anything like that in the monasteries. They said it was very old, it had come from Tibet, and it was dark brown in color with very bristly hair. Monster Quest has acquired some of those hairs and is preparing to test them. When you're doing a hair comparison, uh, the knowledge that you bring is the, is the starting point. Jason Beckert is a researcher with Microtrace a laboratory specializing in the identification of unknown materials. The first step is just to look at the hairs as they are with the eye, and then from there we'll move on to low-powered stereo microscopy. 
and uh, if need be, we'll continue on and uh, not look at the hairs under higher magnification under a polarized light microscope, and uh, if potentially necessary, cut cross sections and transverse sections of the hairs. Beckett will continue his examination of the hair in an effort to identify its origin. Meanwhile, other evidence collected is being analyzed. After thorough examination, Dr. Jeff Meldrum believes that the footprint brought back by the Tom Slick expedition in 1959 may in fact be that of a known animal. This is uh, markedly different. The toe row uh, is uh, parabolic or arched here across the end of the foot. There only appear to be four digits, but the witnesses indicated that uh, upon discovery there were five toes, two of which blurred during the casting process. The relative breadth to the length of the foot is much more indicative, combined with the other features, of a bear print, the print of a hind foot or hind paw, rather, of a bear. But when Meldrum compares the track to an earlier and better known footprint, he makes a startling discovery. Probably the most famous is the Shipton footprint, which was made by uh, Eric Shipton and Michael Ward in the uh, Menlung Basin of Nepal back in 1951. Shipton and Ward took these photographs of the prints, which were then reconstructed in three-dimensional form. It was hoped that the reconstruction would help prove the existence of the abominable snowman. One of the interesting and uh, mysterious things about this track is the, is the unusual arrangement of the toes. Uh, here we have this unusually and disproportionately enlarged toe, second toe, which is in fact reminiscent of the human condition known as macrodactyly. Macrodactyly is a condition where a digit becomes unusually large due to an overgrowth of bone or soft tissue. It appears the footprint actually stepped on an area of meltout in the snow and ice and that what has been interpreted as this large wide heel is, is just an artifact. In reality the footprint outline comes down here tapering to a much narrower heel which also would force us to, to rotate the axis of the foot bringing the big toe more down onto the medial side and the inside edge of the foot so that it, it looks like a divergent big toe of a great ape. The conclusion that one of the tracks is likely that of an ape is significant because there are no great apes known to live in the Himalayan region. The nearest habitat is roughly 2,400 miles away. Meldrum adds that the similarity between the Shipton print and the footprint of a great ape is compelling. The presence of the divergent big toe in the Yeti footprints, those that are most compelling, would suggest that in fact this isn't an animal restricted solely to the ground in the, in the alpine zone of the mountain ranges, but that it frequents the forests of the subtropical valleys and likewise uh, forages and feeds and perhaps uh, sleeps in trees and therefore relies on a divergent big toe to uh, climb into that, uh, into that habitat. However, it is difficult to determine conclusively based on a single photograph. If, if uh, Shipton and Ward had only photographed a second or third footprint, much of the controversy surrounding that, that instance would be laid to rest. The expedition team, led by Adam Davies, reaches an altitude of more than 10,000 feet. The same elevation where the Eric Shipton tracks were found. Temperatures have plummeted. They begin to see snow and hope to find tracks. Now this is what I've been waiting for. <laughs> Some snow. I've got my boots on. I'm ready to go. The team must be alert to both altitude sickness and avalanches, common causes of death in this region of the Himalayas. The team must traverse the edge of a glacier and over an area buried under an avalanche. I'm 
good, I'm good. The fall is a brutal reminder of the dangers of the region. The guide checks the climbers for signs of altitude sickness. I'm doing it in a minute. So, how do you feel, Adam? I feel tired. Oh, you feel tired? Yeah. What about disease? No disease yet. No disease. Oh, it's, it's okay. I think no problem. Yeah, no headache. Yeah. I think no headaches, no disease. I think it's good condition everyone, I think. Good condition? Yes. Yeah. We've still got a heck of a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. Still. At this well, altitude, there is 40% less oxygen than at sea level, causing lungs to work much harder. For locals, altitude sickness isn't a risk because their bodies are acclimated to the thinner air. The climbers arrive at camp just before nightfall. Yeah? Fantastic. After four days and climbing 11,000 feet and crossing terrain that even, in, even one of the world's leading mountaineers describes as tough, we're finally here. The temperatures are nearing single digits as they set up camp for the night. The team wakes and begins to prepare the balloon for launch. I'm starting to get all the pieces together at the moment, checking the electronics, and uh, everything's looking good. Excellent. While I'm preparing, you're going to be going up there and finding me a place to target with a thermal infrared camera. See you later. The group sends out a small scout party to target the balloon flight. We're taking sun power, we're converting it into electricity, and we're storing it in batteries. These batteries will be used then to charge the batteries that I've brought along to operate my gimbal, which we're going to put up on this big sphere with an infrared camera, and uh, do surveillance on the hilltops around of an evening. The thermal camera will be able to get a bird's eye view of the surrounding wilderness for miles, something unattainable on foot. Wow, we're struggling. But a check of the helium tank reveals a leak, a development that could compromise the entire mission. And just at that moment, the team makes an exciting discovery. So, uh, guys, see some. Looks like prints. Monster Quest is searching the Himalayas for the mysterious, abominable snowman. Explorers from around the world say they have seen and heard the beast. It was seen in this area first, in 1971. Japanese explorers had been searching the area around Nepal's Mount Dulagari when team leader Mitsuhiko Yoshino had an encounter with a monster. The first time was the highest, at over 16,000 feet. The team set up their camp for the evening while sensing something was stalking them. They heard screams throughout the night. We heard the Yeti's cry over a period of two days. It was clearly a kwa sound that it was making. The eerie howls continued into the early hours. Yoshino went out to investigate. Expedition leader Mitsuhiko Yoshino saw an animal covered in hair. He saw the animal standing there, and when it came down, it said it came down on two feet. Yoshino was at a distance of 30 feet, so he was really close. He got a good look at it. Overcome with fear, he was unable to get a photograph. 